Nowadays, the majority of employers want us to work for money that can't even help us buy necessities. And if we don't work for such low incomes, it is our fault. In this video, we will discuss how we can come out of this disagreement so that we can live a financially stable life. But before you learn about the great labor shortage crisis, pay attention to the big red subscription button. As soon as you click it, you will be taken to the wealthy side, the life you deserve, where you'll find hundreds of videos. These videos contain the answers to almost any question you may have. There are also daily updates, so if you want to stay tuned, remember to turn on notifications. The aftermath of the coronavirus has caused the U.S. unemployment rate to soar to a staggering 15%. Many companies went out of business, and many more had to drastically slash costs to survive the challenging years ahead. This unemployment rate has now decreased to 6%, which is still significantly higher than it was before the economic shutdown, but is unquestionably a vast improvement. This is because of the stimulus checks and the coronavirus's spread slowing down. The USA deals with a different, somewhat contradictory issue. People are no longer having trouble finding jobs. Finding employees is a challenge for businesses. Some of the biggest companies across the country are paying applicants $50 just to show up for a job interview due to reports of a significant labor shortage. In Australia, people who work for Uber and complete 20 deliveries receive a signing bonus of $500. Additionally, those same businesses are now forced to provide higher salaries and possibilities for professional advancement beyond the minimum wage they had previously offered to entry-level employees, which makes this sound like a good thing. Unemployment rates decrease, earnings rise, and conditions improve. What's not to like? Unless you own a fast food franchise? However, these positive headlines have some economists very concerned. To fully understand, we must, as always, examine a few specific factors in greater detail. To fully comprehend what this could all mean for the recovery of the American economy as a whole, we must first determine why economists are concerned about people having a choice of jobs with better pay and conditions. We must also determine what could happen to the overall economy as a result of this situation, as well as the best way to capitalize on the apparent increase in demand for new workers. You've most likely heard the phrase full employment. Politicians and economists frequently use it, and it is also one of the primary goals of the Federal Reserve Bank. However, the expression full employment is a little deceptive. You could be excused for believing this equals no unemployment, but it does not. For instance, that has never been accomplished because somebody will always be unemployed in a major economy like the United States. So, what exactly does that mean? Well, economists are somewhat conflicting on this. While everyone acknowledges that the unemployment rate can be low, it will never reach zero. Based on what is known as the natural rate of unemployment, the initial approximation of this is made. This indicates that the only persons unable to find employment yet are eager and able to do so are either temporarily unemployed or undertaking training in a new line of work. Frictional and structural unemployment are the terms used to describe these situations. These types of unemployment are typically seen positively. Contrarily, cyclical unemployment is what we are usually concerned about. This unemployment is a byproduct of the changing business cycle. Fewer demand results naturally from the recession in the economy, which implies fewer workers are required to supply the reduced demand. When people lose their jobs and money, they are unable to make as many purchases, which lowers demand and perpetuates the vicious cycle of unemployment. To prevent this, the central bank is responsible for, among other things, ensuring full employment. However, the job can occasionally conflict with the central bank's primary duty to control inflation. There is another definition of full employment that has to do with the phrase you may have just heard mentioned in the news, the NIRU, an abbreviation for a non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. The economist's opposition to zero unemployment stems from this. In his initial analysis, William Phillips discovered a connection between the unemployment rate and inflation. Notably, there is a non-linear link between high employment and high inflation. Inflation increases along with employment levels, but problems only arise after inflation exceeds this arbitrary Nairu threshold. This theory's real fundamentals could not be any simpler. It's a supply and demand situation. 
Picture a world where unemployment is as high as 15% as it was just a few years ago because of the coronavirus. You are in serious trouble if you are one of the 15%. Many people will be interested in applying for any job vacancy, and many will labor for a low pay just to get a job. It is important to note that this is terrible news for those who are structurally and frictionally unemployed as well, since they may be preparing for or moving into positions that are no longer available. The labor market is, in the end, just a market like any other, and more people hunting for limited jobs results in more supply, less demand, and eventually lower pay. Enjoying till now? Please hit the subscribe button now, like, share, and comment. And yes, keep watching. The contrary is now also accurate, although to a far greater extent. If unemployment rates fall below this Nairu threshold, then practically everyone who wants a job will have a job. Assume you are a hiring manager and you advertise a position. If no one applies, you may have to offer a little higher compensation, entice candidates from other companies with attractive signing incentives, or even pay them $50 to attend job interviews. Now, a little bit of this is significant because it gives the labor force's negotiating position a little more clout and means that you don't have to work in an atmosphere that affects your long-term health, but too much might be problematic. There is definitely a case for raising the minimum wage, but what happens if eateries are forced to start paying all of their personnel, say $100 per hour, to draw in enough workers to keep the business afloat? The salary costs of these companies would eventually make it unprofitable for them to continue operating, which would result in their closure. As a result, there would be fewer food places available for consumption, which would allow the restaurants that were still open to charge more for their products in the now-cornered food market. This is an extreme case, but even little increases in income can cause prices to rise over time. Now, it's pretty simple to increase unemployment. It is as easy as shelving a few government projects. Maintaining the lowest level of unemployment while avoiding excessive debt or inflation is difficult. For political reasons, the government works extremely hard to reduce this number as much as feasible. This is achieved either directly through employment and government or indirectly by decreasing taxes and generously allocating funds through the fiscal budget. This second approach has the drawback of potentially generating an entirely new category of unemployment that doesn't receive nearly as much attention. Institutional employment, like these other types, is unemployment brought on by institutional decisions that affect the labor market. This can involve a variety of things, such as a mine being closed down because the employees threatened to form a union, or businesses refusing to recruit people of a certain race or gender. But more frequently, it has to do with the government interfering in markets. A large number of experts are currently arguing that the measures implemented to shield individuals from the direct economic effects of the coronavirus were excessively generous unemployment insurance paired with payments of up to $300, which means people are earning more money by staying home than they would by working, thanks to the weekly average and several stimulus payments. This choice makes good financial sense when hidden expenses like childcare, transportation to and from work, and extra dining out since you don't have time to prepare meals at home are taken into account. There is still a global epidemic, given the option of staying at home or working in the food services industry where you would frequently interact with hundreds of people. Although this is a hypothetical situation, many of us believe that we would know which decision to choose. However, if you're the kind of man that appreciates a hard day's work and is given a choice, you would typically choose to work for your own money rather than accept aid. Even if the earning potential is the same, you would need to pay me a sizable premium for taking that risk, given the current state of the economy. The non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment that we were investigating before may effectively change as a result of this entire process, and it does so often. Following the 2008 financial crisis, the race increased by 1% to slightly under 6%. Of course, with unemployment at that time hanging around 8%, it was never really an issue. But today, we may be in an even worse economic scenario than we were back then. In a relatively short amount of time, millions of people were laid off as a result of COVID's impact on the world's economy. Most individuals have had to find alternate means of assistance in the months since then. This might involve anything from returning to school, being retrained, receiving government assistance, or just finding a new career. Life finds a way. 
In the present day, the same companies are reopening and seeking new employees. Although there are more jobs available than ever before, some laid-off workers may decide to continue with the alternative they discovered during the shutdown instead of looking for new employment. When more individuals enter the workforce, this will ultimately level off, and fewer firms will need to employ personnel to reopen. What can you do then to profit from everything here? So, now is the ideal moment to begin looking for a new position with higher pay. For the first time in a very long time, companies are competing for workers instead of the other way around. According to a Forbes survey, workers who stay at the same company for more than two years often earn 50% less money. Now, we learn from all of this that if you are not happy at your job or that working at a place where your mental health is affected, it is better to leave that place and take a couple of weeks off to relax than start searching for a new job because now is the perfect time to look for a new job. Did you enjoy the video? Please hit the subscribe button, like, share, and comment.